Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for showing up. Um, this is going to be fun. So you are attending Open Source GIS for Local Government. Thanks for being here. Six practical examples is what we're going to be going through. Um, I have a lot of material uh, I'm going to be going through today. Um, and uh, with each example, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tools I used within either QGIS or PostGIS, maybe some plugins that I might have used uh, in the process. Uh, and I hope from it, you're going to take away some, some knowledge um, and you're going to dive in, maybe try a little bit of this stuff um, on your own. So let's get going. Oh, I should say one one more thing. Um, Q&A are open. Um, I think Q&A is open. Let me just make sure that it is. Um, yeah, we should be good to go. If it's not, you can post questions. Uh, if any questions that you post, I will get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, uh, and if you have any follow-up questions, my email will also show up on the last slide. Um, so you can always email me um, if there's something that you really want to uh, to chat about. Um, if you do raise your hand, I'm probably not going to be addressing questions just yet, but I will be addressing questions at the end of the webinar. Thanks, everyone. All right, so a little bit about Luna Geospatial. We are a consulting company that specializes in open source GIS. Um, we do everything open source. Um, we do a lot of analysis, remote sensing analysis, uh, vector-based analysis, setting up uh, uh, databases. We offer training, we offer support, uh, and a variety of other services. Um, we also have a data a software development division. Um, we build things like web GIS, dashboards, data portals, um, things of this nature. Anything that's really database driven is something that is within our wheelhouse. The other service that we offer are fully managed GIS servers. Um, it's hosted in the cloud. There's nothing on premises. Um, we run backups. We provide support. We provide training. Um, so if you're interested in sort of diving into open source GIS, this is a really great way of doing it. You don't have to configure anything on your own. Uh, and you can start using things like GeoServer and PostGIS tomorrow. Uh, we have a number of clients around the world, um, many throughout Canada, but also around the world. Um, we work with agricultural organizations, environmental nonprofit organizations, uh, a number of mining companies, a number of universities around the world. Um, and each one uses open source GIS to some extent. Some have complete GIS servers and others are just using uh, individual components, perhaps in their web GIS. If you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter. Um, we try not to spam our list. Um, we sort of inform you about a bunch of things that are going on. If we have upcoming webinars, if we have upcoming training sessions, um, this is a great way to stay in touch. Um, another thing you can do is you can check out all of our past webinars at lunageo.com slash webinars. Um, all of them are there. There's a number on QGIS. And most recently, um, we've done a bunch for um, local government. Uh, and I know that's why a lot of you are here today. Um, the, the last one we did was on multi-user editing with QGIS and PostGIS in an enterprise environment. That's very helpful. And then the previous five webinars, uh, we did a sort of coast-to-coast -coast tour. Um, and in that, the, these webinars are largely the same, except for the demo portion of the webinar, which I tried to use sort of local data as I was showing things off. Uh, so you can check those out. A lot of the technology that I'm talking about today, PostGIS, QGIS, and things like this, I, I'm not going to dive in and explain the, the bits and pieces of these. In these webinars and in a bunch of our previous webinars, you're going to get a good idea of how to use uh, these technologies. What I wanted to show today was really practical examples. Um, so our attended, intended audience, anyone interested in open source GIS, you're in the right place. Anyone interested in open source GIS who also works in planning, engineering, or local government, you're definitely in the right place. Um, and anyone considering migrating to open source GIS, um, I hope to provide you with a lot of information to answer the big question that I'm going to ask soon. Now, no, this isn't a training course. So if you're you're thinking that what's going to come out of this is a complete tutorial on every single one of the examples that I've done, um, you may be sad in the end. But wait, there will be a surprise at the end. Um, agenda. We are going to talk about flood risk analysis using an amazing plugin in QGIS called River GIS. We're going to talk about asset management with QGIS and PostGIS and how you can organize some of your data. 
Uh, we're going to talk about parcel management with QGIS and PostGIS, land surface temperature and vegetation cover in London, Ontario. I'm from London, Ontario. Uh, I'm here now. Uh, so a lot of the data that we're going to talk about today is from the town I live in. Um, we're also going to talk about the greenest roads in London, and we're going to talk about income and access to green spaces in London, Ontario. Uh, so something important that I did want to mention here um, is that all data and analysis performed as part of this webinar is for instructional purposes only. Some data are simulated. Example, the asset management data. I don't have that level of detail um, to do asset management with uh, many of the data sets that I can get through the open data portal on the uh, Open London uh, website. Um, and all results, therefore, have not been fully ground truths. We, this isn't um, about scientific rigor here. The focus here is on uh, the tools and capabilities of open source GIS, uh, not the specific results. Um, any one of these studies that I've done, these sort of examples that I put together, if I was going to dive in, I could do a lot more work um, just to verify the results. Um, so this is my big question. Can we do everything we need with open source GIS? Uh, I deal with a lot of clients. I set up servers. I set up databases. We build custom applications for them. And this is always the, the root question. Um, can we do everything with this? Can we move away from proprietary GIS and use open source GIS for our day-to-day -day, um, work? And I'm hoping that at the end of this webinar, you're going to see that you, you, you can. You can do a lot of what you do, if not any everything you do in GIS uh, with open source uh, GIS. So let's start talking about flood risk analysis with River GIS. Um, this slide didn't take me very long to put together. I, I searched in Google and uh, for flood, and I started naming provinces in Canada, and I found articles coast to coast about um, flooding. Um, and this is, you know, there's a really good reason for this is that the there is an increase in the number of uh, major storm events, the, both the intensity and frequency of major storm events um, that are causing a uh, vast majority of flooding. But there's another aspect to this as well. Um, this is a good example. The Office of the Auditor General in Ontario released this brief um, for an audit that they did on climate change adaptation, reducing flood risk urban flood risk specifically. Um, they noted that municipalities need better information from the province to help prepare for urban flood risk. And I'm showing this because I think this is probably a common story that we will hear um, you know, around the world. There's probably many different countries that are experiencing the same intensity of, of flood events. Um, billions of dollars are needed to update stormwater infrastructure, but municipalities have re have reliable uh, don't but few municipalities have reliable funding models. And lastly, the other important point here that and we're going to talk a lot about green spaces today, um, green spaces which absorb rain and reduce the risk of flooding are being lost. So the process is fairly simple here. You know, climate change is, is causing more frequent and severe rainfall events. Um, and one thing that most municipalities need, local governments need, uh, are accurate hydraulic analysis um, is really the first step toward mitigating the devastating impact of flooding. Um, the go-to tool um, when doing these types of analyses is the Hydrologic Engineering Center's River Analysis System, uh, known as HECRAS. Um, it is a hydrological engineering application to model, among other things, steady flow, 1D and 2D unsteady flow, sediment transport, and water quality analysis. Um, but um, in order to use it, you need to prepare your data. So you need there is a process of, of, of assembling your data and turning it into a package that can be read within HECRAS. This is really a good job for GIS analysts. So River GIS is a QGIS plugin for creating HECRAS flow geometry from spatial data. Um, and one thing I really love about this, and if you've seen any of my other webinars, you know what I get excited about, it's PostGIS. Um, it uses PostGIS uh, for a data store and for spatial operations. So as you start creating your layers that are going to be eventually used in HECRAS, those are stored within PostGIS. Um, it produces all the files necessary to run HECRAS. Um, for, for example, a basic process looks like this. Create or import the layers into PostGIS, and you can do this through the River GIS interface here in QGIS. 
Um, you using LIDAR or air photos, you can edit the newly created layers and trace things like banks, river center lines, uh, and your cross sections. Um, next, you can set up the DEM and DTM within River GIS. Four, uh, you can digitize additional features, things like bridges, culverts, storage areas, uh, to make a more accurate model. Next, you're going to create the the um, the RAS GIS import file. This is the file that you'll actually import into um, HECRAS. You'll start HECRAS and you'll open the geometric data file from QGIS River GIS. Um, and seven, you will uh, set up the model and run it in HECRAS. So example, you can apply a storm model with so many millimeters of rain, and you're going to see how the uh, your river reaches will perform under different scenarios. Next, you're going to set up a model and run it in HECRAS. Uh, so, so once you have various models that you've created, you can run them over and over again, change the parameters and see what happens. But the really neat thing is that you can then export uh, your layers. So you can view the water surface in, in RAS Mapper. You can also export that layer. And then when you export it, you're able to bring it back into QGIS and, and compare it to things like parcels, buildings, uh, and other critical infrastructure. Um, so the process really is, uh, it's quite simple, it's a four-step process, is data preparation, and this is where QGIS comes in, QGIS and PostGIS, and using this plugin, you're going to do all your data prep in QGIS, you're going to import the file into HECRAS, and you're going to export different scenarios. So example, you could export something like a 100-year storm scenario and then see what, what happens. Uh, and import those layers within QGIS, of course. Um, so I really like this. I know a number of organizations, we have a number of clients that actually use this, this quite a bit um, to do flood modeling. And it's really a great tool. Um, my understanding is that oftentimes these tools aren't available in some other applications, but it's really nice that QGIS has this, especially in version three. All right, part two. Uh, so that was a little bit on flood flood uh, mapping. So let's talk a little bit about asset management with QGIS and PostGIS. All right. So asset management refers to planned approach for managing and invest, investing in a municipality's infrastructure. Um, and we're, when we talk about assets or linear assets, we're talking about roads and buildings and dams, drinking water infrastructure, bridges, wastewater, and so on. And the list goes on and on and on. So there's really three main questions that we have about assets is when was it installed? Um, what is the replacement cost for the asset? And what is the current condition? Brit, park bench, uh, ID, one, two, three, four, five. Installed date 2018, $500, good. This is typically the information that we're collecting and modifying and updating over time for all municipal assets. Um, so for this, I made up data. I don't have the installation year for uh, all the roads. I wanted to use roads. I thought it was a nice example. Um, so I just used some random values just to create a year between 1990 and 2023. Sounded right. It sounded like a good place to start. Um, so I, I, I created these data. These data are simulated. Uh, so don't go back and say, London has so many streets that are this old. Um, these data are just made up. All right, so I, I did this in QGIS, of course. I, I mean, in PostGIS. So I just ran a few uh, SQL queries, and you can see here I used the random uh, function here just to generate a number between 1990 and 2023. All right, so if we had a nice data set with years for installation years, we could ask questions like, how old is the road system? And we could put together a nice uh, SQL query to ask this question, and we could get results. We could say, uh, there are so many kilometers, which represent a percent total of the road system that were installed in 1990. Um, what is the total length and percentage of the road system that was installed before 2000? So here we can get a little bit more fancy and we can say where the installation date is less than or equal to 2000. And we can get the total length of the road. And we know that it represents about 31% of the total road system. 
Um, so what is the replacement cost for all roads installed before 2010? I just assumed it would be like two mil, two million per kilometer. That sounded like a right, uh, a, a good number. Um, so what we did here is we calculated the road replacement cost. And you can see here that I took the, use the function ST length, which will get the length of the geometry. I converted that to um, kilometers and then I multiplied it by 2 million to get a good uh, indicator of how much the road system would cost would cost. Um, and of course, I added the wear clause, which indicates that it, only the roads that were, were installed before 2010. And we can get values now. So we produce this very simple report. Um, okay, so let's get a little more fancy. Um, so what what is the replacement cost for all roads installed before 2010 by road type? Um, so here we're going to be looking at where installed before this date and we're going to get the different types of streets um, within the city. And we're able to have, we're able to group by those. All right, so what is the replacement cost for arterial roads installed before 20, 2000 in central London? So here we're going to get a little more fancy. Uh, and you can see here in the where clause is that we're not only looking at where it intersects, we want it to be arterial roads. We want the GIS feature uh, field, which is actually the district, to be central London. And when we do this, we are going to get some nice results. And we can even display this on a map. So this is a really a nice way of doing it. We can look at um, we can look at uh, the tabular data. Uh, we can we can uh, compare that to with the spatial data and connect them and make relationships between them. Uh, and we can quantify uh, the assets. So this is all very basic sort of analysis stuff that can happen quite quickly. The nice thing about doing this within QGIS is that you can save these queries and you can run them on a regular basis. So as things are changing, you can run this report over and over again and get these values. So what about condition ratings? So again, I, I just you know fudged this data uh, and I added a bunch of condition ratings from one to five. One is very good, five is very bad. Uh, and I just use again, the random function just to generate this field. And I updated the condition rating field. Now, normally you might do this in a separate table. If I was designing this for a client, I would put condition assessment as a separate table because each asset is gonna receive a number of different um, condition uh, assessments over time. Uh, and uh, one second. All right, so you're going to receive a number of different assessments uh, over time. So I might store that in a separate table. So what is the overall condition rating of London streets? So we can put together this nice query against our data. And you can see here, we're going to be using a case clause uh, just to convert those ones into the actual uh, word that we're using for here, or the, sorry, the integers into the actual words. And we're going to be grouping by the condition rating. Uh, when we do this, we can we get a very uh, simple report that shows us the condition rating from one to five, from very good to very bad, and then the total length of each uh, roadway. Um, and we can also see this on a map. So we can export these data to um, or view them, any of these queries within QGIS. Um, so again, very handy stuff, very easy to run through. And it's something that, that's easily repeatable um, whenever you need um, these data. All right, so let's turn fancy to 10. All right, so what are the top 10 districts with the poorest roads? So I, have, I assume poorest is the oldest, okay? Um, so when we run this, we are going to be doing a spatial join. And when we do the spatial join, we're going to find that areas like Tempo have the total length uh, of 42.29 of kilometers that have a, a rating a greater than or equal to four. Um, so they're bad. All right. So that's enough about asset management. The point I wanted to make here is that once you have everything within a relational database, you can make relations between different um, different layers within your database. It's really quite easy. It's easy to store the queries. Um, and once you get going writing these, it's really easy to actually just get into SQL. All right. Parcel management with QGIS and PostGIS. Um, there are a number of tools for editing within QGIS, you know, the same that you would find anywhere else within a GIS. There's the basic digitizing toolbar uh, and the snapping tools that allow you to snap to 
um, to, to vertices and so on. These are the basic tools that we use when we're editing or creating or editing any geometries. Um, there's also the advanced digitizing uh, tools. Uh, there's the tool as well as the panel. Um, and with the panel, you're able to do a lot of neat things. You're able to uh, select the, the angle and the distance. Um, so you're able to make really exact measurements um, when you're adding something. So think of creating something like a subdivision. You're going to be able to easily go through and, and say, I want it to be exactly 500 meters from this corner. And then we're going to cut exactly 90 degrees, or we're going to be in parallel to the other line. So these are CAD-like tools that you're able to use directly with within QGIS. Um, the nice thing is you're able to lock these as you're doing. So I did this where I was just creating a subdivision within uh, one of the parcels, and I was able to just simply lock the angle or the distance. And then uh, because I had the snapping tools enabled, you're then able to, um, to draw a very accurate square. Um, now, once you have your parcels in, in PostGIS, it's really nice because, again, you can relate them to a number of different data sets, uh, things like permits, inspection, property taxes, proposed changes, data auditing, uh, even attachments. Um, so this is something that we do quite often is that, you know, you'll have this data set within your database and then you're, you're going to want to make these uh, uh, relationships. Um, think of something like uh, if you wanted to assess how green a parcel is. This isn't something we did for this, but we'd be able to do that quite easily. If we had some satellite data looking at an NDVI, you'd be able to quantify the greenness of each parcel within a city. Importing parcels into PostGIS via QGIS is really easy. There's an import vector layer tool that you can use within the database manager, and it allows you to set things like the primary key and the geometry column. You can even set the target uh, coordinate reference system if you want it to be somewhat different than the one that the data is originally in. Uh, I also always do things like convert field names to lowercase, and I create a spatial index. Once this is imported, um, it shows up within your database. And what's really nice is that then when you're in your um, browser panel, you're then able to see that layer loaded into QGIS and use it like any other layer. Um, another thing that I wanted to show you was if we wanted to create pr a proposed changes table, this is what I'll often do with clients who are gonna be managing parcel data. Your parcel data are kind of sacred. You don't wanna just go in and edit them randomly, especially if something is just a proposed change. Um, so what we'll often do is create an additional layer called parcel proposed changes. Uh, and this is where you can make notes, uh, you can draw up the new subdivision, uh, you can style it on a map in a different color. It's really a handy layer to have if you're going to be doing any level of parcel management. The other thing that I, I, I'll always do with a layer like this that's quite sensitive is I'm going to create an audit table and an audit trigger. Um, the audit table is going to record any change that happens on any of the tables. So I do this for parcels as well as the parcel audit uh, table. Oh, sorry, as well as the parcel proposed changes uh, table. So in this example, you'd be editing the parcels, which are in black, and you'd be drawing a proposed change, which is orange. So you're only editing the proposed changes uh, table. How this works in the audit table is that you're then going to see the action is an insert action. Um, and what it records is it records the new data. The original data is null, as you can see here, um, in this row right here, uh, because there was no previous values. Now, if we went in and we updated it, for actions, you see a U for update, and you would see the original data and the new data. Uh, so it's quite easy to come back to this table and restore some data if somebody might have changed the roll number or have done something else. Uh, you can control those things. Another nice thing, if you look at the webinar from that I did last month um, for, with multi-user editing, is that we can get really granular and control what people can do. Um, we could say, okay, you can't edit the parcel table. Nobody can edit the parcel table except for one person in the organization who's qualified and who has the authority to actually modify the parcel table. You can see it, but you can't edit it. The only thing you can edit is the proposed changes table, um, and that will sit on top of the parcel table. And even then, there's only certain fields that you're able to edit. You can't edit other fields um, that you shouldn't be able to change. 
Um, so what about spatial joins on parcels? So what planning districts a uh, district are parcels in? This is a really easy one to do. This is just intersecting the centroid of the, the, the parcel um, with the planning districts in London. And you can see that we're just doing a spatial join. A spatial join is a select query um, that creates a temporary relationship between two or more layers. The bonus here, of course, is no intermediate data, no temporary data. Um, so if you're doing this for any reason, um, you know, just to show somebody or just to add it, add it to a map um, or to select if you want to do where at the end of this and say where the planning district is um, uh, central London, you can then export all of the parcels that are with that intersect with central London. Very easy way of doing it. Um, so other possible layers to join might be zoning or census dissemination areas, ecological environmental zones, flood risk zones. So if we go back to our flood analysis, this is a good way of taking parcel data sets and then running that intersect between. And the nice thing, again, you're not creating intermediate data. There, you're not filling up your file system with a whole bunch of little queries that you're testing back and forth. It just lives within the database. All right. So how many parcels are in each planning district within London? So this is where we're going to actually use the count uh, on the parcel data set. And we're going to count the number of parcels. And now we get the number. Um, and, and these queries are quick. These are just like, you know, maybe a second. Um, but I, I don't think so. I think a lot less. So this gives us a good idea. We get a count of the parcels within each of the districts. All right, moving on quickly. Number four, uh, land surface temperature and vegetation cover in London, Ontario. This one is fun. All right, so let's talk about heat island effect, urban heat island effect. It occurs when natural land cover is replaced with surfaces that absorb heat. In cities, this includes buildings, pavement, and other structures, of course. So trees are cool and buildings, you guessed it, are hot. Um, so some of the consequences associated with this, and this list can go on quite a bit, especially if you dive down the sort of the public health highway here uh, and look into the, the negative health effects of, of this. But um, some of the main consequences are increases in energy costs, air pollution, and the bad stuff that comes along with that, uh, heat-related illnesses, and mortality. So London has 42 planning districts. Um, and you can see right away that when we're looking at these is that we have very different land cover types in each. Um, we have new residential developments that encroach upon um, agricultural areas. Um, we have mature residential areas that have tree-lined streets and parks and golf courses. Um, we have downtown areas that are largely devoid of trees and filled with buildings and parking lots. Uh, and we have agricultural areas that have none of the above and are filled with agricultural fields and agriculture-related buildings. So what we did was we grabbed the level one Landsat image taken, taken on September 1st, 2022. Um, we used an amazing plugin in QGIS called the Semi-Automatic Classification Plugin, SCP, to pre-process the imagery. And we were able to simply output um, the temperature by inputting this Landsat data. Then we did some styling, we did some analysis. Um, so some of the things to note is that the average air temperature on this day um, was 22 degrees Celsius. Um, the mean land surface temperature was 21.9 degrees Celsius. Um, the maximum land surface temperature was 25.7, and this is found in White Oaks area of London. Um, and the minimum land surface temperature was 19.7. This was found in Tempo. So if we look at White Oaks, we can see it is all in red. Um, it was very hot in this area compared to the surrounding um, areas. Um, and if we look at this area just from the aerial perspective, again, we're not doing intense analysis on here, or land cover change. We're just simply looking at the aerial. Um, you can see that this is, this is quite a residential area, but we also have this big red blotch. Um, and I put that on LinkedIn recently with a, with a post asking if anybody could guess what it is. It's a shopping mall. Um, the reddest of the red is actually on top of the building. Um, and then the parking lots aren't nearly as hot as the building, but still quite, quite hot compared to the surrounding uh, areas. 
Now, the other interesting thing about white oaks is that the only blue that occurs is a small patch of trees uh, in the southwestern corner of the district. Um, there aren't a lot of forested areas in this area. It's a major shopping area in London um, and residential area. Um, there aren't a lot of big parks with mature trees, uh, but there is this one small patch. And it's interesting that the patch does trigger in, in our uh, rendering here on the left, it does trigger a little bit of blue is starting to show um, just in the bottom there. But for the most part, um, the residential streets, they're just as red, almost as red as the area surrounding the shopping center. Um, so this gives you a view of what this area looks like. There are trees, but you know maybe not as many as some of the other areas that you're going to see as we go in. So tempo, what's tempo? Why is it the lowest? Um, and it's an agricultural area. It's one of those areas on the outskirts of the city. There's no major buildings. There's a couple of structures that have higher heat signatures, but for the most part, it's a cooler area uh, relative to the rest of the city. So what is the relationship between land surface temperature and vegetation? I think you can probably guess this at this point, but let's dive in anyways. Um, so we use the normalized difference vegetation index, the NDVI. I'll be using this for a few different things um, today uh, in London. And again, from the same uh, date of September 1st, 2022. Uh, so if you're not familiar with uh, with uh, NDVI, basically uh, it's a combination of the third and fourth band in Landsat, the red and the near infrared band, uh, and it gives us a really nice index of how much vegetation is on the surface, where one is very dense vegetation, like forest, and minus one is no vegetation, probably water. So the average NDVI in London at this on this date was 0.33. So some vegetation, um, uh, but not, you know, not one. Uh, it's not a complete forest, uh, but there's probably a mix of land cover types here, which there is. Um, and the lowest NDVI is in White Oaks. It is, um, it is with uh, 0.21. And the highest is in Tempo, which is 0.42. Interesting. Um, so uh, looking now at, at the uh, NDVI, we can see how the neighborhoods are, are split up. And you can see White Oaks is quite high again at 0.21. Um, but then now let's look at this. If we look at the whole neighborhood, we can see White Oaks up here and Tempo way down at the bottom. So um, areas that have low NDVI tend to have higher surface temperatures. And Conversely, um, areas that have a higher NDVI value tend to have lower, um, lower surface temperature. Uh, we know this already. We know that more vegetation, more, more mature trees, more natural land cover types will make, make for a much cooler surface. But it was really interesting to see that at the district level, uh, it really is this obvious that we have this very nice line, uh, um, uh, this relationship between these two values. All right, summary of tools that we use for this. Um, I really like the semi-automatic classification plugin. I'm really thinking about doing a webinar looking specifically at this plugin. There's so much you can do with it. Um, and it's what's incredible is that in the even in the installation process, you install the plugin, it takes like under 10 seconds to install if you have a solid connection. And there are just so many tools in it, so many different things you can do with imagery using this application. Um, we use the raster calculator to create the NDVI, but even that, that could have been created within the SCP plugin. Uh, we use the zonal statistics tool quite a bit. That's a tool that just takes the area, uh, it takes a polygon as input, and it will um, calculate the uh, average values of whatever raster you identify. And what the, the the graph that I just showed on the previous slide, that was created with a, another plugin called Data Plotly, um, which is a D3 plugin to produce graphs. Uh, really neat tools. Um, encourage you to uh, go out and try those. All right, so we're moving on now. Look at this, we're making good time, people. Um, so we're going to talk about the greenest roads in London, Ontario. Um, so uh, the importance of street trees. Um, they improve air quality. There's a lot we a lot of research has gone into looking at street trees, um, and these are trees treed treed roads, uh, and the trees can either be like 
on the side of the road like this, or maybe on a property that's, that's right beside the road. Um, they reduced the urban heat island effect and helped cool the air. Um, so we saw this in, in the previous example where we're looking at heat island effect. Uh, we can see that in, in the residential areas where there are a lot of trees, um, we're not, we, the, the, the heat signature is significantly lower. Helps with hydrology. It has a benefit for things like uh, uh, it slows stormwater and, and helps with runoff and helps absorb a lot of this water during uh, rain events. Uh, wildlife habitat is a very important part of, of cities. Uh, and having more trees means that you have more habitat. Uh, it, there's been a lot of studies on how trees and tree-lined roads, like on the top picture here, actually helps reduce traffic speed. I, I didn't go into it too much, uh, but there were a number of studies that came out just pointing out that for whatever reason, people are driving a little slower when there are tree-lined streets like this. Create safer sidewalks and walk appeal. I think that's something that's important, especially as people are talking more and more about things like the 15-minute city. 15-minute uh, city doesn't really mean much if you're walking in the blaring sun uh, and getting a sunburn and getting tired. Uh, there are health benefits, and obviously the top one in there is protection from the sun. But I also read a number of studies that were saying that um, having tree-lined streets like the one on the top actually protects people on the sidewalk, too. So if somebody's I don't know, running off the road in their car, um, the tree is going to serve as a protective barrier, assuming they hit the tree. Um, there's also aesthetic qualities. Uh, this goes without saying. If you're looking to buy a house and you're going to one of these new subdivisions that doesn't have a single tree in it versus a neighbor that has mature trees. Uh, most people are going to lean towards the, the neighborhood with mature trees. Um, connection to na nature and mental health. Um, these are very important things um, is that is that we we feel a lot better when we're surrounded by nature. There's also economic benefits. There's economic benefits for you. Um, if you have a property that has a number of trees, chances are your property value is a lot higher than somebody who doesn't. And the list goes on. I found a lot of really neat examples. I even found somebody who did some uh, some public health studies on things like <clears throat> seniors falling. And they did an analysis and they found that <clears throat> it happens less where seniors are walking underneath treed areas. And I think that probably has a lot to do with the heat um, as, as a contributing factor to these falls. <clears throat> Excuse me. So London, Ontario has 1,935.5 kilometers of roads. Um, so let's measure the greenness of them. So to do this, we created an NDVI image of London using Landsat 8 from September 1st, 2022. We buffered the roads dynamically based on road type. Um, so based on the average width of different types. Now we could do this a little more um, accurately if the municipality actually does have the width of every road and includes the sidewalks or maybe even a little bit area. Beyond that, um, we can use those polygons instead of buffering center lines. Uh, you can get the mean NDVI value for each road using the QGIS zonal statistics tool. Um, and then what I actually did before that is I just connected the values back to the center lines. I didn't want to have buff. I didn't want to insert the buffered uh, uh, roads into the database. So what I did is I instead just created a relationship between uh, the buffered and, and the original center line, brought over that attribute value, which is the average NDVI value. And then I was able to upload that into the database. And then you end up with something like this, <clears throat> is that you end up with your center lines and we're able to style them according to uh, NDVI value. All right, so we're able to ask these questions now. Say, what is the total length of roads with low NDVI in London, Ontario? Um, so again, everything's in post just so I'm able to just run a query and get these values. Um, and you can see in the where clause here where, where NDVI mean is less than 0 0.2. We're just going to use that as our arbitrary cutoff for an area that has low vegetation. And we can see that the road types that have the most, uh, um, or, or sorry, the least vegetation on them 
um, are local roads. And there's uh, 303, almost 304 kilometers of roads within London, representing about almost 16% of the roads in London um, are, according to this definition, um, have, a, have a low amount of vegetation surrounding them. So the interesting thing here is that about 36% of roads in London have little or no tree cover. About 67% of those roads are either arterial or local roads. So these are in residential areas and parts of downtown all around the city. So measuring the greenness of roads, which planning districts have the lowest percentage of treed roads? So what I did here was a little bit different. I created a materialized view. And if you've done anything within databases, you might be familiar with, the, familiar with this, but when you create a view every time in QGIS, you're sort of zooming in and out, it's rerunning that query and it tends to be quite slow to use. So something that's nice to do for two reasons um, is I create something called a materialized view. So it's sort of think of it as kind of like a temporary table that lives in the database that was created using some sort of query. So that's nice. It's faster because it looks and feels and acts like a table. Um, the other reason is that it stores the query that was used to create it. Um, so we've used this fairly complex query that has a bunch of spatial joins and things like this created on it. Uh, but this is stored with the definition of this materialized view. So we can always come back to it quite easily and modify and change it. The other nice thing is that in the browser panel, it shows up as a table. It looks and feels and acts just like a table. But if we ever want to, we can go back and update it. So which planning districts have the lowest percentage of treed roads? Back to our question. So top districts for lowest roads, Bostwick, as 89.9% of roads have low NDVI. Uh, and you can see why. <laughs> um, it is a very residential area. There's not much else going on here. Um, and there are no trees. It looks like a uh, residential uh, wasteland here. Um, another area is central London. Uh, this is the downtown core of the city. There are trees, uh, but there aren't a lot of them. There's a lot more parking lots and cars than there are trees. Uh, and this contributes to that, of course. The other one is Fox Hollow. Um, and you remember this maybe from a previous slide is that this is one of those residential areas that are kind of encroaching on farmland. So there is a lot of farmland still in Fox Hollow, but um, there's also a lot of brand new residential areas, and these were formerly agricultural fields. There were no trees in this area. Um, so as they're being built, there's really no trees on the properties whatsoever. Uh, there's no trees in the background or along the roads. So you, the majority of roads in these areas have low NDVI because there's simply no trees. <clears throat> now, I just wanted to give you a contrast here, and this is this is an interesting contrast, that Oak Ridge in London only has 10% of its roads have low NDVI, um, because this is a very mature neighborhood. It's been around for a very long time and has mature trees everywhere along each road, in the backyards, a bunch of parks, big parks, soccer fields, you name it, um, whereas these new development places look like this, and they're sad. But... The, I guess the idea is that over time, this is going to look like this. And that's kind of the goal, right? All right, part six, income. Our last one, income and access to green spaces in London, Ontario. <clears throat> All right, so a little background on the Canadian census, if you're not familiar with it. So a dissemination area is a small, relatively stable geographic unit composed of one or more adjacent dissemination blocks. It is the smallest standard geographic area for which all census data are disseminated. DAs cover all territory in Canada. So in total, there are over 57,000 DA boundaries in Canada and there's about 586 in London, Ontario. So now instead of looking at things at like the district planning areas, now we can look at things at the DA level. So we get this boundary file, we load it into PostGIS. Um, just to make things a little faster, uh, I, I filtered out the uh, London DA boundaries. I intersected it with the polygon for the city boundaries, and I brought all those DAs uh, into a separate materialized view. Um, then I can just use them however I want in the database. So also note that the last Canadian census was in 2021. 
The boundary files are shared in sheet file format, so you can just download the boundary files for all of Canada um, and load those in. Uh, insert, they're inserted easily into PostGIS using QGIS, the database manager. You'll see that from some of my previous webinars. Really easy way of just loading spatial data into your PostGIS database. So for the tabular data, it's a little more tricky. Uh, census data are provided in tabular format. There's these massive CSV files. Uh, the DA data are split by province territory, so you can download each province and territory and, and combine it if you wish, or if you're only interested in something like Ontario, which I was, I just downloaded Ontario. Um, Ontario, just to give you an idea, is about eight gigs of data, uh, and it's inserted into PostGIS using QGIS. Um, and we have uh, field data types. Uh, one of the big things I had to do was I had to fix the field data types in Postgres. Um, we had problems with those um, in the past. So I was I had to go in and um, uh, fix all the data types for it. Uh, it was a, it was a real problem. But um, I when it inserted, I think it inserted everything as bar chart. So I just had to go through and fix. Um, you can do an insert statement. That's a lot easier to uh, to do as well. Um, and once you have it figured out, you just run it for any other data set that you're running from the um, census data. All right. Okay, joins are created between DA boundaries and the tabular data. And again, I just extracted just the London data because that's all I was really interested in. Um, and I create a materialized view for specific statistics. And this was nice because I could then go in and tweak it if I wanted to, um, and I could modify it. So here's a good example of just creating one materialized view um, for the population 2021. So this is just the total population of the DA. So the question I wanted to ask was, is there a relationship between income and green space within London, Ontario? We could dive into this subject deeply. Um, we could do uh, tons of spatial analysis. We could use, do network analysis. We could find the nearest parks. Um, we could calculate the walking distance to the closest park if you live within this DA. Um, we could do a lot here. But I did, an, it, I did quite a simple bit of analysis. Um, so what I did was I used the mean NDVI um, as just an indicator of, are you living in a place where there's a lot of green around you? Are you living in a green space? Um, the highest mean value that we pulled out of London was 0 0.42, and the lowest mean when we're looking at things at the DA level was 0 0.07, so quite low. Again, the DA boundaries are quite a bit smaller in terms of area than the uh, uh, district boundaries. Um, the other thing we are doing for income, um, so an indicator of income, we're using the median income or the mean median income. So um, for each of these, uh, we do have the median income for the DA, and that's used as our income indicator. Uh, so we're the highest mean income, or actually I should say median income there uh, for the DA is 75, DAs are 75,000 uh, per year. The lowest is 21,400. So when we look at this on a plot, it is just a jumble of points for all the all 500 and something uh, DAs that are here. But if we look at this top part, what's interesting here is that for every um, income area, uh, and income is on the bottom here, and mean NDVI is on the y-axis. Um, so for every income, uh, there is... Uh, Every income exists in an area where there is higher um, vegetation or more vegetation within an area. But the interesting part is down here. So these are areas that have lower income. Um, I think it peaks out at like $52,000, $53,000 per year and goes down to almost our lowest value. So if we use 0 0.2 as that cutoff for NDVI and say anything that has more vegetation than this up there and anything that has less vegetation down here, where are these areas? Um, so with po posters, we're able to do, you know, run this analysis quite easily and spit out these polygons. And what's interesting is that it's an area where there is a lot of uh, economic problems within the city. So central London, east London, all the way over to Argyle. It's a real cluster of DAs uh, within the city that have this, um, that have both lower vegetation and lower incomes. All right. 
So the median incomes are not over about 50K in areas with low NDVI. So if we define low NDVI as anything lower than 0 0.2. Conversely, all income levels are represented in areas with higher NDVI values. The largest cluster of low income and low NDVI values, in, as I said, in central and eastern London. So again, most of this was done within um, within PostGIS. Once you sort of do some of the analysis with using some of the QGIS tools, and then once you have it within PostGIS, you're able to run um, quite a bit of analysis on this. All right. So with that said, we have about. Um, 10 minutes left, but uh, so we're making very good time. So I wanted to ask everybody a poll. So of the six examples, again, with each of them, we didn't dive in too deeply. I didn't show step-by-step -step how to do these things. Uh, I'm gonna launch a poll now in the webinar. Um, so everybody can answer and say of the sort of six that I showed you here, if you want to see one as a blog post and when we do these things, we're gonna share them with you. Uh, we'll email everyone. Um, I will put it all together, send it out. And um, you can then um, um, enjoy, and I'll supply data. I'll supply the satellite data if you need it. I'll supply the NDVI images, or I'll get you to make the NDVI images. I'm just watching the poll right now. There's a lot of activity. It's going up, it's going down. Which one will win? Right now, just so you know, asset management is in the lead. Um, <clears throat> parcel management is doing pretty well. Unfortunately, my green spaces, nobody cares about roads. Nobody cares about roads. Three people do. That's nice to see. Some people care about uh, land surface temperature. I really thought that one would be like through the roof, not. All right. We Anybody else, I'll leave this open just for a minute. I will sip my coffee. It's going to be very boring for anybody who's watching this afterwards. You can just skip past this, this part if you'd like. All right, I'm going to stop everyone. I'm going to end the poll. And it looks like it looks like asset management has won uh, by, by one vote. I guess I could have kept it going to see what would happen, but don't worry. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing about this is that I will, um, I share the results with you. Um, I will actually do all of these, um, but I'm going to do one first. This is what I said. Which one do you want us to do first? Um, so yeah, I'll do the asset management one. I'll put together a little bit more of a complex database that actually includes a lot of different things in it, um, including both uh, the asset itself, um, inspections, um, and a few other little things. So I'll make a series of tables that you can just run, install within your own PostGIS, or talk to me if you want a little PostGIS database. I, we can probably set one up for you guys uh, quite easily. Just reach out. Uh, I will stop sharing the results now. Okay. Um, another thing that we're doing that's kind of fun, I think, um, is whenever I do these webinars, a lot of people want to talk. They want to reach out. We want to have a chit chat. They have questions. They've been using some open source GIS. They haven't been using some other stuff. Let's talk. Um, so I, I say this when you when you go on to this link, um, and I'll share this in an email afterwards if you you know not writing the right sort of complex little URL here. Um, I will share this with you in an email after this. Um, but this isn't a sales talk. This isn't me coming at you. I don't have slides. Um, it's just us having a chance to talk, talking about adopting open source GIS, maybe you're considering migrating to open, G open source GIS, maybe you have a server uh, and you want to have a chance to talk about what some of the problems or some of the challenges that you might face. I like talking about workflows. Um, if you have something that you want to create, um, let me know. Um, training and support, if this is something that you're, you're interested in and want to know a little bit more about, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, custom software development, we build things. We, we make dreams come true with GIS. Um, so we can we can build something for you. Uh, we can also talk about some pain points. If you are an early adopter of open source GIS or a recent adopter of open source GIS and there's some things um, that are that are causing you pain, uh, we can talk about those. Um, so I will tell you, I'm going to leave this uh, AMA open uh, until July 20th. Um, I have actually added dates too. So if you're in uh, whatever time zone you're in, I think um, there's probably a time that we can meet. Um, I am happy to meet as early as 6 a.m. in the morning Eastern because GIS never stops. 
Um, and then we can just have a chit chat about this. All right. So with that, I'm, I will open up the questions and I will see what people are asking about. Oh, whole bunch. Holy moly. Okay. Some people can't see my screen. I'm sure you fixed that. Um, all right. First question, asset management. Can one use Python instead of, instead of SQL uh, for the same analysis? Yes, you can use anything you want to do the analysis. Um, I'm really one who thinks that uh, use the tool you're good at, use the tool that you can, that will allow you to do it. If you want to just do all of this using native GUI tools, you can do that. Um, I see some advantages of using SQL, um, uh, but really what it comes down to is use what you're good at. Um, um, I can make the case for, for using SQL, but um, if you're really, really good at Python and you can do a lot of interesting data analysis with Python and associated libraries, uh, more power to you. Go for it. Um, will we be recording? Uh, get a recording via email? Yes, you will. Um, sorry, I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but yes, there will be a recording that will be shared. Uh, we put all of our webinars on, on YouTube, so you'll be able to watch them there. Uh, street trees, what tools and how can we predict stormwater flow by analyzing uh, street trees in urban settings? I am not a, a hydrological engineer, but I think, um, can you do it in that grass? I don't know. I'd have to ask somebody I know. I'm, I'm not going to give you an answer. Um, but um, I think that, uh, I think it's part of the analysis, but I'd have to dig in a little deeper. Flip me an email and I'll ask us, uh, I'll ask somebody I know who does that stuff a lot more than I do. Uh, will I be recording the presentation? Yes. Does parcel management include topology? Yes, it does. Um, uh, yeah. Well, it, there, you know, there, there's topology tools that you can use. Of course, there's, there's simply using the snapping tools if you're going to be making some changes. Um, but I will tell you that, um, in PostGIS, one of my future webinars are going to be on the topology types and what we can do with topology within uh, PostGIS. Uh, I've been, it's something that I've been trying to dig into a little bit more um, and it's been on my to-do list. I will, I will do it and I will share it when I do, can, when I can, it'll either be a blog or a webinar. We'll see what happens. Um how easy is it to get into these different areas and public GIS poverty? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, do you find you need to demonstrate your background uh, qualifications uh, uh, on these topics uh, or is it relatively open? I, I don't know. I think that it's good to just sort of get experience within anywhere you're working, right? Is that if you can gain some sort of experience, I think that I, I, I got experience working at the local government level just by getting a very basic job doing some Im image analysis for a local municipality. And I really, I remember them saying to me, I was like, are you sure you want this job? And I was doing my PhD at this time. And I thought, yeah, it's like, this is good experience. It's something practical that, that is going to be important to have under my belt. Um, so yeah, just try to get in, try to get in somewhere and start doing something. There's no small jobs, right? Uh, training and support. I'm interested. Okay, sure. Um, uh, kindly shares today presentation. Yes, I will. Scenario building plan for different urban planning applications. So let's satellite imagery resolution. Oh, the satellite Im image. The if you're talking about resolution, if for, in terms of the spatial resolution, this was Landsat. Depends what we were looking at in terms of the spatial resolution. Now, of course, there's different types of resolutions that we talk about when we're talking about uh, uh, satellite data. Um, if you're talking about spatial resolution um, for the uh, the temperature data, that was 100 meters. Um, but Landsat is also, you know, you can get 30 meters, you can do pan sharpening down to 15 with, with Sentinel, uh, you can get down to 10 meters, uh, you can get high res data if you really want, uh, but there's always a trade-off, right, is that the, the higher spatial resolution you're going to get, you might get, um, you might not get as many bands, uh, so you might not be able to do as much analysis on it as you would with something like a Landsat product. You also always have to aim at whatever you're actually going to be doing with it. If you're looking at agricultural fields, this is what Landsat was designed for. Um, uh, it is a great tool uh, to use for that. If you're looking at something like a city, uh, uh, it's a great tool to estimate things like tree cover, uh, to do a tree canopy analysis in an urban setting. Uh, it's, it's great for that. I use it for my PhD when I was looking at tropical deforestation in Belize. Um, so yeah, it's a great platform. All right. Tons of questions. I love it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please reach out. Um, I'll be uh, more than happy to answer any more questions. 
Uh, you can book a meeting with me if you want to have a chit chat um, or simply send me an email at uh, cpatterson at lunageo.com. Thank you everybody for coming. This has been fun.